Oh, thank you, baby. Ooh, we look at y'all. Uh huh. <laughs> Take these glasses off, cause if I see something, I'm not gonna only say something. I may have to go with you. Oh Lord. Eddie, how you doing? I'm doing well. It's I'm Black doing... History Month. It sure is. Yeah. It sure is. And Eddie, is history we have all made as Americans? But why is it significant today in the 21st century that we keep a focus on knowing black history? Well, first of all, it's such a delight to be in conversation with you. It's just a blessing and to see all of you. I think it's, it's crucial that we understand the past that has made us who we are. And there is this kind of parallel, these parallel stories. The story we tell ourselves, the myths and legends that affirm our sense of who we are as the shining city on the hill. And then there's the actual lived experience, the stories that don't come into view, what we might, dis what we might describe as the undisclosed features of American democratic life. And it seems to me that when we, you know, how, let me put it differently. The stories we tell reveal who we are and what we choose to leave out, our, leave out of our stories all too often reveal the limits of our conceptions of justice. So who and what we choose to leave out actually reveals, exposes you know, moral shortcomings. So it's important for us to tell the story. And African American History Month, uh, which was Negro History Week, is this moment in which we tell the story not only of black achievement, but we also tell the story of the complex contradiction at the heart of the American experiment. I couldn't agree more. And along those lines of telling this history, it's also about the narrative mm -hmm. and shaping that narrative as part of telling our story. What is the narrative of the 21st century black experience? Is, is it different from the 20th century or the 19th century? And it brings me back to, and, and I'm going to, quote James Baldwin or misquote James Baldwin uh, so that Eddie can correct me because he is the <laughs> premier uh, historian and writer on James Baldwin. But can we tell this story, can we write a narrative in the 21st century that exclude racism as part of our story, history? Oh, oh no, oh no, Why absolutely not. You know, to quote Ralph Ellison, mm. the author of Invisible Man, he talks about the, what he calls this tricky magic, that this country really doesn't understand who and what it is, that we don't really know who we are. And in the moments in which those contradictions bubble up, we have to consolidate a notion of whiteness so that our differences are lost in this idea that we are all white, right? And that we is a complicated we coming out of my mouth, right? So, but the tricky magic is that happens by way of a procedure of scapegoating. These black folk, these other folk, allow us to consolidate a notion of whiteness. So here we are in the 21st century facing the terror and panic of demographic shifts. Mm. The browning of America, the discomforting reality that you know, these folk elected the first black family to be in the White House. These folk got these racially ambiguous children on Cheerios commercials and all of this other stuff. And they don't know what the hell to do with it. And so what do we see in response? In some ways, the 21st century is wash, rinse, and repeat. Same damn thing over and over and over again. Echoes, even though we have this historic, these historic achievements. Because in some ways, the country, in my view, and I'm going to ask you a question next. The country, in my view, refuses to grow the hell up. It's stuck in a kind of perpetual adolescence. And by virtue of that fact, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. it refuses to look itself in the mirror. 
Now, what do you make of the state of things? And you've, you've been from Jesse Jackson campaign in 1984 to all the work from that moment on. You have seen the shifts in our political landscape. You have been privy to the political discourse. What do you make of this moment in the 21st century when it comes to race and democracy? You know, as a black woman who grew up in the segregated Deep South, I spent much of my childhood wondering if I would live long enough to see my old age or my senior years or even my middle age. I'll never forget when I wrote in my diary. And by the way, I'm Catholic, so I will always my diary always started, Dear God, because I was afraid that if I talked to the priest and confessed what I was feeling, he would tell the Monsignor, and the Monsignor would get so confused, he would tell the bishop, the bishop would talk to the archbishop, before you know, the cardinal will be in my business, <laughs> and the pope, so I went straight to God. I'm like, I'm not messing with you, man. <laughs> it just ain't time enough for me, so I know I ain't time enough. But you know, I'm still a good Catholic girl now. I go to church every time I can, and I love it because, you see, unlike some people who go to mass, I go to church. And St. Mattress is probably the most beautiful church on the planet. That's when you get on your knees next to your bed. That's St. Mattress. I'm a living <laughs> witness that you all should visit St. Mattress on a daily basis. It will make you feel better. So how do I feel? I, I really did believe growing up, and we didn't grow too, f but we grew up, what, less than 100 miles from each other? About an hour and a half. Yeah, right. man. You know, we, we share that, that muddy river, that Gulf Coast breeze, heat and humidity. We share all of those things together, mosquitoes, snakes. Mm -hmm. But we also have four delicious seasons, crab, crawfish, oysters, and shrimp. Mm -hmm. So it ain't that bad. That's right. <laughs> I grew up knowing the history of black people. Not because it was taught to me in fourth grade by Miss Eugene of fifth grade history with Mr. Lee. I grew up because I had grandparents who wanted us to know as much about our condition, our environment. There was a reason for everything. And the one thing that they stirred in all nine of us, there were nine of us, did I tell you we were Catholic? <laughs> my grandmother had 12 children, my dad was number 12. I said, the one thing he never had to accuse us of is, you know, leaving somebody behind. We just had more children. Mm. But I grew up thinking, listening to them, that I could create the change or create the environment that would be totally different from the one I was experiencing meaning that I would be able one day not to, you know, have to cross the street when a white person appeared on the block. I could be the kid that, you know, could walk on any side of the sidewalk. I was determined when I got on the public bus, the airline bus, that I would sit wherever I wanted to, like Rosa Parks. I did. I didn't know that you had to go to the back. Hell no, I'm sitting right, I'm like Rosa, I'm sitting right here. And because I believe that I can make change possible. When I was a little girl, I used to have big dreams. I mean, I still have big dreams. And I don't know, being out here in California with these big mountains, I might have bigger dreams next week. Mm. I mean, these mm. are bigger than levees. Mm. Um, but my dreams were big. And part of what I was dreaming was, well, you know, I mean, Abraham Lincoln is a, is a great guy. I really like Lincoln. And I said, well, what if we try having our own black president so we didn't have to rely on Lincoln to be the only black one? And I would ask my grandmother, because I thought she knew Lincoln. I thought she knew everybody, including Jesus. <laughs> my grandmother was so old, I never knew she had any other color hair but gray. And look at me. Um, but I just knew I could do it. Because in telling our history, mm. they told me a history where they survived all of the adversity. And that they saw a way out of nowhere. And they had hope. They never gave up hope. And my grandmother, because she really read that Bible, she loved the Lord. I learned the scriptures that she would 
recite every day or every night because I'm like, she must know something because she's reading that Bible. So I read the Bible. And do not grow weary in doing good for in due season you reap a harvest if you don't give up. What has happened in America where we cannot reap that harvest? What has happened in this country where we want to stop and turn back the clock and go back? Ain't nobody going back with you. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to the back of the bus. Mm. I'm not going back to being three-fifths anything, and I am not going back and settling for those old stereotypes that essentially defined me as something that was not even human so that when people beat me, whip me, and threaten me, they didn't see me. They did not see me. And so I fought my entire life to be seen, to be heard, to be known as a human being. Without hate, but with love. Because that's what my grandparents taught me, love. How could these people love folks? They did all of this to you and you still love? It was the night, Eddie, that Dr. King died. That I knew. I knew what I had to do. This was a Thursday afternoon. Like tonight, and it was raining. I'll never forget it was raining. And grandma told us to take off our good clothes. You know, when you came home, take off your school clothes. They were your good clothes. They're like your church clothes. You only wore them once a week or once a day, period. You put on your play clothes, I mean, whatever. And grandma said, you all got to get on your knees and pray. And I'm like, who did When you had to get on your knees and pray during the day, somebody died or somebody was dying. I mean, look, we knew enough at that point. And, of course, being the curious kid, the third of nine, why are we praying? Donna, shut up. Really? Why are we praying? Dr. King has been shot. And, of course, even at eight years old, I understood that. I understood that. And I wanted to go into a fit of rage as a kid. Who would shoot Dr. King? Why would Dr. King be shot? I mean, at that point, we didn't know if he had died from his wounds or whatever. We learned that later that night. But as we were praying, my grandmother told us to pray for Dr. King and pray for his family, Mrs. King. But this was the one that got to me, Eddie. She told us to pray for whoever did it. And I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> and here come my grandmother back with Matthews about loving thy enemies, loving. And I'm like, here we go back to loving people. How can we love people who hate us? How can we pray for people who want us dead? And so for me, I have measured my life by how much progress can we make? How do you keep pushing? How do you keep turning? How do you keep staring? How do you keep loving people? And that is ultimately my test as a human being. But that is the test we all have as Americans. How do we keep this American experiment going? You talked about democracy yesterday. Mm -hmm. You and Doris and you know, Douglas. I mean, you guys were like, yeah, y'all brought it back. Y'all brought it back. But fundamentally, as a country, we're out of sync with all of the so-called values that we uphold and enshrine, even in the words and our documents. We're not in sync, mm -hmm. the majority of us. And yet we got to keep pushing and keep stirring and keep moving forward. Because ultimately, I do believe there's a there's a force in this society that will move when we start moving. But as long as we sit back and just accept the status quo, we're not going to change. And I'm going to say something, and I hope this ain't awful. See, I told this to Eddie. I was doing my confession yesterday. You know, give me a glass of wine, I'll tell you any damn thing. <laughs> okay. And don't criticize me, because what was Jesus' first miracle? He turned water into wine. He listened to his mother and got the party started, so I'm a Christian woman, period. <laughs> so by the time I reached my 20s, and I had, you know, I was stern as much as I could, organizing anything that needed to be organized, getting things done that people say could never happen. Like my first campaign, national campaign, was to help make Martin Luther King's birthday a holiday because they told me it couldn't happen. I said, really? <laughs> Bullshit. Two years, we got us a holiday, y'all, okay? So I was on to something coming out of Jackson campaign. 
And that was the year that I said during Lent, I went to church. You too. That's why I tell my priest, and you too. <laughs> and my priest said, what are you giving up this year? White people. I said, I had to give up this whole concept of whiteness and white people because you know what, they're in my mind and they don't know who they are. So I'm going to, here's what I'm gonna do for my penance. I'm going to Europe and figure out who white people are because they're not, they don't know themselves. They're not telling me nothing about themselves. And how can I love people that don't love themselves because that's why they hate me. They don't love themselves. So you know, I really, I spent that year in Europe. And let me tell you, I came back telling everybody, are you Irish? Oh, I think I'm Irish too. Let me tell you why. <laughs> are you Italian? Oh, child with them onions and that tomato. I'm Italian too. And, and then the French and the art and the white. Oh, I fell in love with white people. And then I had to come back to America and tell them why you were so great too. Hmm. Why are you mad? White people didn't know white people. And you have the nerve to hate me and you don't know yourself. You're not, you're not loving yourself. So how far have we come? We've come a long way, but we still don't love each other. We don't love meeting each other. We don't love knowing each other. We don't love learning that we're complex and crazy too, just like you. But you don't see us. You don't know our humanity. Hmm. And that brings me to what just occurred this past month the beaten and death of Mr. Nichols. Hmm. Eddie, we thought after the death of George Floyd that America would come to some reckoning, some moment when we can start to see each other as one, start to heal, start to address systemic racism. What happened? And why didn't we fulfill that so-called pledge of commitment to do better. It's the American theater of race. That's what we do. You know, I mean, we see the ugliness. We see the horror. We clutch our pearls. We cry crocodile tears. Baldwin echoing Emerson says, sentimentality is the masks of cruelty. Richard Wright said he wanted to draw a character that didn't get, that didn't call forth crocodile tears. Mm -hmm. So you cry your crocodile tears and you say, oh my God, that's horrible. And then you'd go back to your lives and policing never changed. In fact, in the midst of it all, in the midst of hundreds of thousands of people risking their lives after George Floyd was lynched, and they risked their lives in the midst of a pandemic that, was, that swallowed death whole, right, in a way. What did we hear? We started hearing the rhetoric of law and order from the 1980s. Start hearing talk about crime as the principal threat and demands for more policing. I mean, the very rhetoric, I mean, I thought I was right back in the, eight, the 90s listening to, you know, watching Bill Clinton in front of Stone Mountain with all of those black men in white. You remember that image, yeah, right? In shackles. In shackles, right? Not just simply Reagan and not just simply Nixon, but the Safe Streets Act of 1968 under Lyndon Baines Johnson. So what we did in that moment, we thought we were in a space where we were going to get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And we got the irony of Tim Scott playing my good friend Cory Booker like, like, a, like, you know, like a toy. Mm -hmm. Nothing was generated. We started seeing again those special squads. That's why I wish Chief Bratton was right here. Those special police units that terrorize black communities because in the United States, forgetfulness is our, our arch nemesis. Mm -hmm. We forgot about ramparts. In Los Angeles, we forgot about the black box and the special unit in Chicago. We forget about all the things that we, and what do we do? Wash, rinse, repeat. And so my baby, who's 26 years old, hmm. our only child, studying in law at Berkeley, wants to be a public defender. 
I'm going to have to make some more money. He's going to be broke. <laughs> I'm going to have to take care of my grandbabies. Mm. Um, he has to, he's growing up mm -hmm. in an environment where if he's having a bad day, I will tell you this story. Yeah. I wrote about this in Democracy in Black. I was elected to be the president of the American Academy of Religion, the largest body of scholars of religion in the world. I'm a country boy from Moss Point, Mississippi. Mama had her first baby in the ninth grade. Grew up near the water. This is big, this is something huge. So mm -hmm. I want to call my mom after I find out that I won. But I get a call from my baby. Mm -hmm. He's at Brown. And as soon as I hear his voice, I said, what, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. He said, Daddy, I, had, I was doing a, a, an assignment for my anthropology class in this upscale neighborhood in Providence. And I'm sitting there, and the police drive by, and they hang a U-turn. And he pulls up, and they get out the car, and he comes up to me. He says, who are you, and why are you here? Mm. And he says, sir, I'm, my name is Langston, and I'm, I'm, I'm here doing an assignment. And the leading's over, and he says, the park closes at such and such a time. And he says, yes, sir, I know, but it's only such, it's only, and then the officer leans over again, touches his gun, and says the park closes at such and such a time. He touches his girlfriend, they get up and have to leave. And so I'm thinking, okay, what if he had a bad day? Right. And he didn't follow instruction. Then the boy comes home for the summer, and he's going to work for, he's working for a nonprofit lobbying the state legislature around capital punishment and stuff, criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. He had on one of those tight H&M suits. <laughs> I don't know how these kids wear these things. I mean, it's, they wear them They too. tight, tight. And so he's, he got this, he got his H&M suit on. He's going to get in this little Honda Civic and he's driving. So I send him off nice. Wow. He walks in. My son's 6'2". He walks into the house and I immediately see something wrong. What happened? This big Division I caliber basketball player mm -hmm. biting on the back of his teeth and said, Dad, I was trying to get to the, to the Capitol. Cop stops me, black cop. Who are you? What you doing? You just going to drive past me? I mean, you lost your damn mind? No, 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 sir. I'm just trying to find a parking spot. I'm trying to get here. Well, go over there and park, he tells me. Mm. So then he said, Dad, I, do. I follow the instructions. Then I get stopped by another cop. And then he starts drilling me. And I said, well, I'm just trying to find. Then I, he said, go over there. And so I pull over there. And dad, I got stopped by another mother cop. Mm -hmm. And at this point, my baby is crying. My only child. And he said, you know what this man asked me, daddy? Hmm. He asked me, who's my P.O.? Who's my P.O., daddy? Parole officer, for some of you who don't know what I'm talking about. And he's crying. So I'm having to figure out in that moment, what do I do to keep this from turning inward? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From this anger yeah. beginning to consume him. What yeah. do I do? I, wish, I reach for the McCallum 25. <laughs> that's some good stuff, too. Y'all know that's some yeah. good stuff. You don't drink McCallum every 25 every day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah. the point that I'm making is that here it is. I went through it mm -hmm. as a boy. Mm hmm my dad went through it mm -hmm. as a boy. His dad went through it. Now, my baby's going mm -hmm. through it. And he had to sit there and watch five black men exact that kind of evil. And so, you know, when I think about it, as long as, there, as, long as we're in a country where there are folks who believe they have absolute authority to use legalized deadly violence, combined with the belief that some people matter more than others. Mm -hmm. And that belief leads them to devalue and disregard particular bodies, such that if I tell you to do anything and you ask a question, mm -hmm. you are immediately threatened. Mm -hmm. And what happens to every black parent in the country at that moment is that we become terrorized. Again. Again. Because the first thing you start doing is worrying about your baby. Mm -hmm. Again. Mm -hmm. So 
I hear what you're saying about love and, and moving forward. I do. But it is an extern discipline. It requires unimaginable work. And then we need to be very, very clear. When your grandmother told you, we have to love the man who killed Dr. King. When my great-grandmama, Ruby Wilson, we called her Mama, told me something similar, not about Martin Luther King, but about hatred and the importance of love. On a certain level, it had nothing to do with white folk. <laughs> it was about us. Thank you. That we could not become the people that was doing this stuff to us. And as Baldwin would say, you know, love keeps us, keeps rage from literally overwhelming us. Yeah. All right. So we got to love so that we can, so that we don't become that which we despise. And that's what my grandmother, ultimately I figured it out. Because when she first said it, I, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't understand it. Um, but I, understand, I, I loved her so much. And I knew she had gone through so much and had seen so much in her 87 years at that point that I could trust her mm -hmm. and believe her. And I have to tell you, as the aunt of 17 nieces and nephews, and I love all of them. I mean, I love them enough that I put a lot of them through colleges. I often say, Auntie Donna is broke. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking about the one who's going to get his white coat in a couple of weeks at you know, we're going to have the first doctor in 400 years. We just got the first lawyer. I am so happy, right? And, and today, my niece, my niece, the one I raised, my sister was 16, my mom passed away early, and my dad looked around, and he said, well, Donna don't have any children. I'm like, well, <laughs> well there's a reason. And... <laughs> And you know, when you're raising children, it's a huge responsibility. And I knew exactly why I did not want to have children. I was afraid that my children would grow up in a world that, where people would hate them and I could not be there to protect them. Mm. I was so afraid as a child that I ruled it out. I said, oh, hell no, I don't want that. I'll change the world, but I'm not going to have children in this world. And here comes Janika. Lord have mercy. But she's grown up with my values, my value system. She's now a principal. And what I love best about this child, and I'm digressing, but I have to tell you because I'm so proud of her, is that when Katrina happened and she went back to the city of New Orleans, she could teach anywhere. Mm -hmm. But she went to the poorest area of the city in the Ninth Ward. That's right. And she's now principal. And she tells me, Auntie Donna, I bring them food in the morning. I bring them, we play classical music. You know, we talk before the school day start. Mm. And that is her way of calming them from the lives that they're experiencing at a young age. Today, they renamed her elementary school, where she's vice principal after Dorothy Height. They renamed her school from Paul Habens to Dorothy Height, from a segregationist, a confederate, to a civil rights champion. And I think about how Janika is now telling me, she said, I'm in class giving my students to talk. Now, Eddie, I asked you this earlier today because I said I'm going to pose this question. How long are we going to give that talk? I mean. How long are we going to have to give the talk? You know, I mean, Vice President Harris said this at the funeral yesterday. Every mother who has a child, the first thing that they want for the child is for the child to be safe. Yeah. So we're going to give some version of the talk, you know, as long as we bear children. Because, you know, as my mama told me when we first had Langston, he's named after Langston Hughes, Langston Ellis. His middle name is shortened for Ellison. We put a lot on that boy's shoulders. <laughs> you did. Um, 
Um, she said, you're not going to stop worrying about him until you die, until he puts you into the ground. And it's so true. And so, you know, but I, then I said, I said this on Alex Wagner the other day on MSNBC. There's nothing I can say to my boy. And there's nothing your, your baby can mm-hmm. say to her students that could save them if a cop is having a bad day. Nothing. There's n- everything that Tyree Nichols did initially was right. Mm-hmm. Hold up. What y'all doing? Okay. All right, calm down. Y'all, t- y'all doing a lot now. I'm sitting down. And then he realized that they were trying to kill it. Mm-hmm. And then you get fight or flight. Yep. That's the psychological response Mm -hmm. to the realization. You know, so there's nothing I could do. I'm going to keep talking to him. Boy, take that down off of Instagram. You don't need to do that. (laughs) Stop, stop. You got to express yourself differently. That rage can't go inward. It has to go outward. Yes. We got to change, use the word rage to manifest (laughs) itself to change the world. But, you know, I wanted to return to something you said earlier. We're, you know, we're walking mysteries to each other. Yeah. We, 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 that's all you need to do is think about your last wedding and who was there. Mm-hmm. I'm at the top of my career. When I go home, it's not a very integrated space. Mm-hmm. My golf partners, the people I share my most intimate concerns, when I'm most vulnerable, segregated spaces, or mysteries to each other. Mm -hmm. And what we have to begin to tackle are the intimacies of our hatred, how intimate the Mm -hmm. hatred is. And when I teach this to my students, I say this, people knew who killed Emmett Till because they played checkers with him. They drank beer with him. They loved Mm -hmm. him. People know who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Don't they? Mm -hmm. How do they know? Because they're your your family members. They coach the soccer teams. And you know what you hear around the tables, your kitchen table. You know what you hear in your day-to-day lives. I know what I hear. You know what you hear. The fact that we're walking mysteries to each other. Yeah. And what stands in the place of it all Donna, it are these stereotypes that stand in the stand instead for the human beings. So there's no basic knowledge, so there's no sense of mutuality, no sense of obligation, just these flat characters like on at, in Ed Abbott's Flatland. No depth, you know? And so cry to crocodile tears, grab your pearls, affirm your virtue then go back and let the world be exactly what it was that produced the horror and cruelty in the first place. If that's what we do, then we're all implicated in it. We're all complicit in it, it seems to me. And so part of what I try to do in my work is to say that as as powerfully and as Mm -hmm. lovingly as I can possibly say it. Because that's the only way we're going to get to a place where where we perhaps don't have to give that talk but we're going to have to give some talk because the world is dangerous and I don't think it's ever going to stop being dangerous because human beings are dangerous too, it seems to me. Beyond passage of the George Floyd Policing Act, if if Congress allows it to go through, and there are other ways to implement some of the particular pieces of it. Uh, Some states can do it. Um, some state legislatures are already moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, citizens clearly can uh, begin a, a, an initiative and put something on the ballot in, in certain states. But by and large, Congress bears responsibility to ensure that we have a 21st century c- policing policy, guidelines, efforts to make sure that we're all practicing the same ethos when it comes to community police and police relations with the community, training, uh, qualified immunity, Mm -hmm. making sure that bad cops are not able to go to another jurisdiction and keep it up. 
But short of Congress, short of the president, what can people do in their own individual community and lives to help educate and help heal so that we're not constantly repeating ourselves? And I just want to, I read this fact that in the aftermath of George Floyd, 229 black people were killed at the hands of cops. Mm -hmm. Black cops, white cops, Hispanic cops. And we don't know many of their stories. And if, you know, I fear that if we don't see a video or a sky cam or something, we, we just don't believe it. We don't think it's happening. And I have to tell you, I, I live in a pretty decent neighborhood in D.C. I live in some rough ones, too. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to go into the hood, as people would say. But the cops seem now not to want to be involved. They don't want to be engaged in the community. They want a standoff approach. And so how do we, in our individual, in our community, communities, do better? Well, I think, you know, I mean, that's a wonderful question. I think we have to get a broader... We have to develop a broader or a different, let me say a different, a different framework for policing and how we talk about it. You know, we're all, we're caught and captured by the discourse of law and order in this country. And law and order really has these various components, as you know, that some communities are to be protected, other communities are to be over-policed and overly surveilled, and actually are under-protected. And then you get the kind of ironic demand from those very communities for more police because they feel underprotected. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do, I think, is move from a discourse of law and order to a discourse of, or a way of talking that's rooted in safety and security. Every community needs to be safe and secure. But safety is not just simply about policing and carcerality. It's not just simply about the threat of deadly force and locking people up. Safety has everything to do with opportunities, has everything to do with education, has everything to do with having resources for mental health, has everything to do with understanding the, the role and place of domestic violence. So it requires, it requires of every community a broader understanding, right, of what it means to protect all of, all of us, right, and that those resource-deprived communities aren't contagion that threatened to overwhelm you. So even in, in New York, not DeSantis', dis, not, uh, not uh, Santos' DeSantos, district, huh? <laughs> Long but Island. That in Long Island, a Democrat lost. He was actually over DCC. Yeah, yeah. He was over the DCC. He lost because there was the rhetoric of rising crime, and in his district, crime was actually on, on the Sean, decline. Sean Patrick Sean Maloney. Patrick yeah. Maloney. Yeah. Crime was actually on the decline. Mm -hmm. And so part of what we have to do is to stop trading in shorthands designed to activate our fears and to actually see human beings for who right. they are, right. to value human beings for who they are. Damn it, I'm tired of having to convince people, that I am just as valued as you are. Thank you. I, I, no more, no less. No. Same. I'm tired of people thinking. See, this is the thing. I'm going to say this. Go. I have tenure at Princeton. I don't give a damn. <laughs> mm. I'm oh. a university professor at Princeton. I don't care. All right. The I said this in the other panel. The loud races are easy. People wearing the hoods, all that other mm -hmm. stuff. That was easy. Easy condemn them. We can affirm our virtue. But the ones who believe that equality is their possession to give to someone else. Mm -hmm. The people who believe that racial justice is a philanthropic enterprise. Something that they possess to give to someone else. We're still caught in the frame. We need to understand that equality is not your possession to give to me. And once we get that out of the mix, then maybe you can, and you and I, can begin to be human beings together. Thank you. And maybe love can flourish differently. We, um, so open up some questions. Brilliantly said. We have about five minutes left and, um, would anyone like to 
raise their hand, a question or a comment. Yes, sir. Stand up if you don't mind so we can all hear. And we'll repeat it if we... My glass is empty. Um, <laughs> it was, I, I've, been, um, I've been a TV commentator for over 20 years. And I love playing the part of being myself. <laughs> I am so delighted that I did that. It was not the easiest, because you know, when you go on CNN or MSNBC or even ABC, you know, you get your, you get your topics. I got my topics today for Sunday. I had three days to think about them. Uh, but when you went on Fox, man, it was like, whoa, whatever. Well, it's coming at you, right? <laughs> and you're like, where are they getting this? And so I realized that my reading material was not part of the research that went into it. And once I got comfortable with how things were being presented, then I went back to being myself. And on the five, especially the five, I was treated very well. First of all, you're not going to mistreat me. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Donna. Go ahead. I ain't the kind of person you ever want to whip or even try to whip or raise your hands. I am my daddy's girl. And that's all I'm going to say, because if I write that book about how a feminist can become a daddy's girl, y'all going to be rocked when that book come out. Mm. But think about it this way. My daddy got four bronze stars in Korea and a UN Medal for Valor. Think about a man who went into the first integrated unit and came out. That's who I am. I'm my daddy's girl. So when I got on Fox, I used to sit there and say, bring it on. It, for me, it was a joyous experience because I'm like, is that what you really think? <laughs> so I would unravel it and try to bring it back and repackage it and see if I can get a different reaction from some of them. Now, some of them were lost. Sean Hannity said to me, and by the way, don't y'all talk about Sean. Sean sent me a case of wine. Case. Sean said, Donna, I really like you, but my viewers don't like when you're on. I said, because I tell them what I think of you, too. And Tucker came up to me and he said, you know, my viewers don't like you. I said, well, Tucker, it's okay. It means that after 7 o'clock, I don't have to work in the 8 o'clock hour or the 9 o'clock hour. I can start my cocktails. <laughs> and, but Laura, Laura Ingram, she wanted me. I said, girl, you know by then I'm having a glass of wine. I ain't talking to none <laughs> of y'all. It's too late, too late, too late. But I loved it. I loved sitting on the couch for the morning. I love, And I went out and bought me, you know how Fox... The foxy girls always had on the foxy lipstick. I said, put the foxy lipstick on me. I let my hair go white cuck. I wanted to be known as the silver fox. <laughs> and Just. everything was going good until January 6th. And that, that was the day I said, I can't do this no more, God. I talked to God. Can't do it. Mm. That was the day I realized that I cared more about my country than anything else. And that's when I knew, again, I was a daddy's girl. My dad loved this country more than anything else in the world. And so I said, I, my contract will expire. And when it expires, I love y'all, but I can't do this. Because I will never lie to get ahead. I would never kill to be better than anyone else. And I would never, ever do anything that would promote people lying and trying to kill. They're trying to kill people I worked with. I'm a former Hill staffer. I thought about my old boss, Eleanor Holmes Norton, 81 years old. Who in the hell is going to get her out of that mess? I started to think about Pelosi and everybody else. So, no, I, I love Fox, but Fox wasn't doing it for me anymore. So I retired, but I'm, I'm on ABC. You can catch me on Sundays unless something, <laughs> unless something breaks. <laughs> One more question before we, yes, stand up, please. Oh, yes. Um, when did you know that you wanted to do this for the country? Oh. You got a tenure, Professor. I'm an adjunct. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go to work. <laughs> yeah. um, probably, um, really quickly, probably, there are two moments. Um, when I was in, the 10th, 4th uh, grade, 10th grade, 
fourth or tenth grade. Miss Davis, I'm remembering her in the fourth grade. <laughs> tenth grade, I did my first, yeah, Mark King thing. So I knew I, I wanted to be, I wanted to, I had a calling to do something in the public. And then I realized while I was at Morehouse, I'm a Morehouse man, can't you tell? <laughs> um, I realized at Morehouse that I was a fish out of water if I couldn't read. Uh -huh. So I get paid to read, write, and run my mouth. So I knew, I found out when I was, I went to college when I was 16, so I, I, I was about 17, 18 years old, and I said, I want to I do this, that yes. is to think for a living. And so that's where, yeah. I knew that night when my mom, a maid, and my dad, a janitor, came home and told us King was dead. Oh. I knew that that was my moment. I cried and I said to my mom, it was wrong, but I would finish Dr. King's work. Come on, Ida. And when you see Jesus and John F. Kennedy and then they put Dr. King's picture near the altar, that's what we had in our house. I went to that altar and I said to Dr. King, I would help finish his work. Mm. And while it may take different twists and turns, you know, I've had many careers, inventions, reinventions, I've fallen down, I get my black ass back up, keep talking, keep writing, keep stirring the pot. But when they told me when I was a little girl that I could do anything in the world, I said, are you sure? <laughs> mm. Seriously? And that's when I said, well, Abraham Lincoln ain't gonna be the only black president. And it may have taken me seven presidential campaigns, 55 congressional, state and local, federal campaigns. It may have taken me 49 states. One more, I'll be Miss USA without the bikini. <laughs> but God put me on a path to help make that dream a reality. And you know, when we elected Barack Obama, I got on the DNC, got on the Rules Committee, pretended to be a lawyer. I understood what I had to do. Fannie Lou Hamer taught us what we had to do. I just kept moving and kept building and kept organizing. And so when I finished that, I said, whew, let's see what else I can do. I tried to get a woman. I tried to get Hillary. Wasn't successful. I tried. And but last year, when I thought God was finished with me, I said, well, you know, I can just retire and drink my wine. And here come Katanji Brown Jackson. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I got one more in me. Go ahead, Donna. And that's how I feel. Every day I wake up, I feel like I'm still trying to complete Dr. King's work. Because it was work that would heal us, that would build us, and that would help create a more perfect union. Dr. King went to that mountaintop. And when I heard Al Sharpton yesterday, sometimes when, when, when black preachers preach, I always say, you know, I'm Catholic. I ain't listening to y'all. But then, but then he said, I'm a mountain climber. And I said, I'm a mountain climber. I'm sitting out here, I'm a mountain climber. I'm going to help. I'm going to help finish that work. But all of you, each and every one of you, you are also obligated to finish that work. That's right. How do you honor trailblazers? How do you honor people? You finish their work. So help me finish the work. Thank you. Thank you all.